we know that happens obviously with the courts and also um, as licensees very much so is that you're asked to participate regularly in campaigns. You're asked to participate in advertising. You're asked to put more signs in your venues. Often lots of signs. So one of the things that we wanted to do was talk about what some of the different accords are doing right across the region and give you some examples. So that if you are thinking of a new initiative, what we know um, and going right throughout the state is that many different different accords are, tr are basically dealing with different issues. And right across the state, there are definitely different circumstances of what what's being done locally. So what we wanted to try and do today is give you some examples and obviously also have an opportunity for you to add value to your own. So what we'd like to do is to show you a campaign that has actually been done um, by Paul and his team, uh, working with um, the Manly Accord as well, or the Northern Beaches Accord, I should say. So we'll show the video. Uh, it's a very diverse region in the Northern Beaches. There's a lot of surf culture around our area. They're, they're healthy and fit and they like good food and beverage offerings. We had 759 detections of drink driving on the northern beaches in the year preceding. One of the outstanding statistics on the northern beaches is uh, there's a drink driving problem um, in the area. I think we're one of the highest in the state. We also did our own research and found that um, quite a significant number of people were getting detected the morning after a night out drinking as opposed to just getting home. The Liquid Court's always looking for opportunities to interact with the community. After finding out that the Northern Beaches had the highest incidence of drink driving in New South Wales, the three road safety officers and I got together and thought of a project plan to address drink driving on the Northern Beaches. We're here to support our stakeholders, including liquor accord groups, police, health, local councils and the community. It's one of the problems that the liquor accord sees they can help address by supporting campaigns that build awareness around these issues. Manly, Warringah and Pittwater Council were involved in the campaign alongside the Northern Beaches Liquor Accord and ourselves, the Northern Sydney Local Health District. We aim to connect and create relationships between our stakeholders to balance industry development with community expectation and harm minimisation. We engaged a marketing company because we wanted the campaign to be really professional and we also wanted something that the pubs and clubs and cafes were really happy to put in their, their establishments. The campaign is about the day after, about recognising that you can still be affected by alcohol the night after a big night out. The campaign involves a number of key visuals displayed on tablets in coffee shops and the reason we chose coffee shops is because after a big night out, often the first thing you want to do is go grab a coffee. So on those tablets, the visuals displayed, but we also have a link to a website called Are You Over It? And on this website, you can enter how many drinks you've had and when you started, and it'll estimate when your blood alcohol content goes back down to zero. The whole campaign was aimed at raising the awareness in the community, and um, people have been actually surprised how long it takes for the body to metabolise the alcohol they've had the night before. The Hungover You're Over campaign is a great example of collaboration with a shared goal of addressing alcohol-related issues. We have a fantastic collaboration with the Liquor Accord, with the, with the local community stakeholders. It makes us a force. They tell us where they're at and we, we do our best to help. We recognise that sharing Liquor Accord successes and experiences of local ideas and real solutions helps others who are aiming to achieve the same goals. From my experience working with the Liquor Accord and on projects like the Hungover Your Over campaign, I can tell you there are a lot of organisations in your local community that are willing and able to work with you on alcohol related harm. Why was that a successful initiative for that accord that's on? Um, yep. Yeah, it was a successful initiative because it just shows that um, the collaboration between the Liquor Accord, uh, we've got the expertise and the project management experience to work on these sort of initiatives, um, but it's often the fact that we don't have any re resources and funds. Um, so by working with Liquor Accords, um, we can get some of these initiatives off the ground. And it's just a bit of a unique way um, to get the, the message out there. Yep. Um, so we all put in a little bit of money uh, and then the Liquor Accord um, put in a substantial amount. And they're very good over at the Northern Beaches Liquor Accord. They also fund a lot of our Stop the Supply campaign as well, which uh, Paul mentioned. So they're a very active group. Are there any questions of anyone else from that campaign and what happened there and what was done? Yep. How is the vision of what we've just seen distributed throughout the community? So where do I see that? Okay, so we've actually just started a social media campaign based on those visuals as well. Um, because as Paul said, we like to have um, quite a lot of reach and social media is a really good way of doing that. 
Um, this is a Northern Beaches campaign, so you have to be on the Northern Beaches at the moment, but the visuals are available on the Olga web website, so if someone, any of the liquor accords are interested, they are available uh, for use. Um, but as it said on the, on the video, we, do have them, well, we did have them in, uh, in coffee shops, so we had a, a tablet which you could go into, and then we did a print run of posters and that sort of thing. Um, and also we provided the, um, some of the li liquor establishments a USB file, so they could put them on their visual displays. And have them like that as well. So definitely from a, a national perspective, there's been a, a little bit of research done and, and Paul even alluded to it about education campaigns and how successful or not they are. And certainly when you look back right throughout the nation in terms of some very, very successful campaigns, the one that has, has, has got longevity throughout the whole country is Don't Be a Tosser. And the interesting thing is the more quirky, the more unique, the more um, point of difference a campaign has got, the more recognition it gets and the more conversation it gets. So what's interesting about that particular one is you can imagine someone going through doing and going, oh, I can't drive for three days, and then all of a sudden everyone queuing for their coffee in, inadvertently has, has actually had that message. So it's a really interesting thing to when you're looking at campaigns from the cord level to actually look at some level of unique and look at those collaborations because certainly the evidence suggests the more people that collaborate, the better the messaging, the more tactile the message can be throughout all the different avenues, you, you do get a better reach and a better outcome. And, and I'll just add that the, the tagline of Embrace the Walk of Shame is quite a, a unique yeah. way of looking at it because we've all seen people the day after a, a big night out and they're carrying their shoes and and getting from A to B, but at least they're not driving. So it's just turning it on its head a little bit and creating something that people will talk about. Uh, and the other thing I will mention is that we did uh, employ a um, professional marketing company who also did the visuals that you're seeing on the screen there, which is Stop the Supply. Um, so just creating that professional um, quality uh, yeah. visual is, a, is really important um, because we're not, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not particularly <laughs> creative either. Um, so the stuff that I can produce is not going to have the same impact. So can I ask a question, is there anyone else from a local accord that wants to share an initiative oh, that they're doing? I'm or? not actually from the accord, I'm, I'm from a, a venue in the city. Um, what about public transport? I mean, yep. we know in the city we have problems, so where well, you are it's even worse, you don't even have a train line. Yeah, we struggle in that so regard as well. So was there any, any, any idea of actually promoting that? Because obviously with a lot of people they walk home because yep. there's no other way to get home. Yeah, so I know the, the, the Manly Liquor Accord have done a lot of, a lot of things around um, late night transport uh, and same with uh, across the northern beaches as well. So there is that component as well. Um, this particular uh, campaign, because Plan B addresses a, a lot of the how you get home um, when you're drinking, whereas so we want to do something a bit different so it focuses the morning after that you can still be over the limit. Um, but yeah, I mean... Public transport's a big issue on the northern beaches and hopefully it'll be better once the bus rapid transit system comes in. But so I'm going to speak. Is any other record like to... I'll grab that for me, thanks. I, any other record like to talk about some things that they're doing, some initiatives that they've worked on that's been a, a good good message, a good story? Yeah, all right. Then probably just on the, on the ID scanning issue, bearing in mind that in King's Cross it's legislated, so the parameters they've got to fit within, bearing in mind originally they weren't even allowed to, to use the real-time photos. There were no photos. Then secondly... They were photos of the photo on the ID, so it could be an eight-year-old Lithuanian passport image. Now it's real-time photos, which helps the police. With the other, the voluntary uh, identification scanning, they can take the use of the information, de-identified, uh, a lot further. So it can identify by the postcodes where the patrons are coming from. Yep. It can be used, like in Newcastle, where the five late trading venues put that in about 2012 when they'd had a 21% increase in their assaults. They, um, they actually put the ID scanning in. They formed a dollar company, which allowed them to um, share the information amongst the venues. And they saw that they've, they've banned over 800 patrons there, and that's leading to further reductions. Uh, similarly, up in Tamworth, they're using that yeah. information. It can, the information, as I said, de-identified, so you don't know the patron name and all the other details, but it starts to ident identify the demographics that are going out. So those measures are, are, are quite good. From an AHA perspective, I suppose we're working uh, strongly in, in working with the, at the local level with the individual venues, with Accords. Obviously in Newtown we're doing some work identifying what the, the local issues are in developing strategies in Newtown. And then uh, I know Rob Stanley-Jones is here, so we're working with other liquor Accords, Miranda, Sutherland, on Bard from One, Bard from All. Yeah. And also the, the one in Wagga that we're now working on down in, in some of the other venues, which is if you've got underage people getting into your venues you, using fake ID, etc., putting your licence at risk pretty much with the new sanctions, 
Um, if you do that when you're under under 18, then you don't get into the premises until you're over 19. Mm, so that's an accord. interesting one. Yeah. It's an interesting one that Wagga are trialling through a number of their premises where if you do use a fake ID, then you get caught in a premise, licensed premise, then you actually are not welcome in any licensed premise in town that's part of the accord until you turn 19 eight years of age. So it's been an incredibly big stick locally and because it's a local regional area, they've been really able to, to actually get that message out there and it, they've actually said it's had a really, really great impact um, in terms of that sale to miners and secondary supply as well. Is there any other, yeah? My venue, we've voluntarily adopted the patron scan system um, and it's been really successful and really positive overall. My question is with so many different venues across the state now using them, is there a way that we can look at linking them between areas? So somebody banned in the Shire is banned in the Cross, is banned in the CBD, etc. Just because it is an invaluable tool of mm. keeping rat bags out. Look, and it is something uh, that we're, we're sort of, we've had discussions with Olga and the police about. Obviously, it's also the Privacy Commissioner. The guidelines that they set in place as to the use of the information uh, provided, and this is where it's, it's, it, there's a protection when you do it as an accord, because you have a collection statement upon entry, that that is what the information may be used for. Uh, if you're using a, a shared system, so you know, regardless of the, the company that provides it, normally because the information is stored in the cloud, as long as it's retained in, as a privacy collection statement, that your information may be used to be shared with other venues with this uh, system, that would be okay but that there's, that's a, a restriction on it. So it's definitely something, because we know it works. We know it works up in King's Cross. Uh, Michael Fitzgerald, I was going to call him Fitzy, but uh, the superintendent said how it works in King's Cross. We know it works up in, in Newcastle. We know it works in Tamworth. So there is a logical extension because it sends the message to the individual. You're no longer anonymous and your behaviour affects not only you getting into that venue, but other venues as well. So it's something we're going to continue to look at. And uh, certainly the National Drug and Alcohol um, Committee, which is a collection of basically 40 of our top councils um, in the country, come together twice annually um, to have these larger discussions and actually advocate from a, from a national perspective on local issues. And one of the things that they are regularly discussing is this need to not continually adding more and more regulation, but actually starting to see how we can really, really push the debate onto personal responsibility. Um, because at the end of the day, that is still what is is kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to actually, there's a lot of obviously venue regulation and all of those layers that come with it, but actually how much more responsibility can we place on the individual? Because it, as commonly said in, in the nation, you know, we, we have the right to drink as white Americans have a right to bear arms. So when we're talked about internationally, that's how Australians are perceived. You know, Americans have a right to bear arms or we've got a right to drink. So it's that kind of level of comparison and how we actually start to get individual responsibility is a, is a big step. Doug, did you no, John basically answered the question uh, that came through with uh, obviously, but uh, the one thing I was going to say was if you are looking for an ID, ID scanning system, look for one that is cloud based, which obviously you've got, just in case that legislation or whatever changes or its approval going forward, so you've got the, you don't have to purchase the system twice. Yep. And Rob, sorry, I did cut you off earlier today because I knew it was a conversation we could have at this session. Did you want mm. to go in and ask that question you were? Um, yeah, I think where I was heading with that question was the one about the, you know, the representation from the liquor accords as part of a state council. Because from where I sit, like having been involved with a number of venues, number of accords over the years, and you look at the screen and you see all the different campaigns, but really there's a few key messages that relate yeah. to every accord. And I think what I'd love to see is the ability for us as accord members to literally create legislation surrounding these, um, these issues that we all have in common. So the example, uh, we, we listened about the successful campaigns over the years that have been done with, if I say um, you drink and drive, you're an idiot. Uh, if I say click clack, front yeah. and back. Now, I'd love to see one that says, is it worth 550? But I want to see it on metropolitan television yeah. such that it becomes like one of these. You know, you yeah. do that and everyone knows what you're talking about. It's about speeding. There needs to be a... a um, an approach, you know, statewide, nationwide, um, and someone talked about denormalising something. Yeah. Well, let's normalise the idea of going into a pub or a club, and if you've had too much to drink, it's time to go. Because yeah. I bet you, I, I don't know whether any any works have been done on the amount of assaults that are created because we're trying to do our jobs, and our yeah. job is you can't be in here, you're intoxicated. So, you know, the the idea, I don't, statistically, I don't know how many assaults are. are uh, you know, happen because of that, 
but I would hope that with a campaign on the, on the television, um, we would hopefully reduce that substantially. And, and also you could incorporate a whole heap of these other ones. So that, that, that one from... Um, and certainly, just to interrupt you there, Rob, too, the Plan B campaign that RMS are, are basically pushing out, that's a year-long campaign. You will see a big push for that over the, the summer break. And they actually um, would love to see venues actually support them in that campaign because it's going to be a very big campaign in terms of Plan B. It's obviously focused on drink driving, yep. but it's got that subsidiary benefit of actually getting people to think about watching out for your, your person you're with yeah. and yeah, being aware I, I, of responsibility. And, and that's fantastic. And that, those sort of campaigns have yep. been around a long time and they are successful. Yep. But I've never, and I don't think anyone has ever seen a campaign that's on behalf of us as licensees yeah. yep. to say, you know, it's time to go, you've had enough. And it's still, you talk to a 40-something-year-old male who's been drinking in the pub or club for years, it's still foreign to them to, to have this person come up and say, hey, it's time to go, it's illegal to be drunk in a, yep. in a venue these days. Yep. And so you think about regional, you think about our regional communities and our regional friends, what actually happens, the, the realities of some of these venues is you know that person. So in Sydney it's a little bit easier because sometimes you don't actually know that person that you're asking to move on. But in a regional area, quite often, that publican or that licensee who's responsible for, for asking that endpoint person to leave, they know them really well and they've been drinking there for years and years. So, you know, that's the challenge of, of, of RSA and how you yeah. actually administer it and what you do with it. So and I'll certainly. just quickly touch on one that we've done in, in Miranda and it's called Shire Drink Think. So what we've done, and I, I saw one on the screen about uh, RSA for schools initiative. Uh, we've, we've gone on, along similar lines, but instead of giving them an RSA certificate, it's like a program um, teaching them of all their obligations for when they turn 18, when they've done their HSC, yeah. to come out into our venues. Uh, what are you going to encounter? You're going to encounter signage, you're going to encounter staff that are going to serve you liquor. Uh, what do you do then? You have a good time, yes, and here's all the, all the uh, other things that you need to think about. So if you get a tap on the shoulder and it's time to leave, here's your transport options, etc., etc. So a lot of that stuff is, is covered off in a, in a bit of a seminar to all our uh, local schools, yeah. um, which is great, but again, you know, it's it's stuff that every accord could benefit yeah. from, and if they're seeing it on the on the television, that that would help yeah. immensely. And certainly, Rob, there are many accords that are actually doing that exactly, going into schools. I know Batemans Bay, um, they all go their, their accord actually goes into the school. We also know in Maitland, they do a similar thing. Also, um, in Brisbane Water Accord, and Tugra Lakes, they do a similar thing. So there certainly are a number of accords that are actually using that initiative um, to do that. But certainly. Um, one of the things that we've heard a lot about so far through the engagement that um, has been occurring over the last little while is this need to actually collaborate with what Accords are doing. And if you've got a fantastic initiative happening over there, here that's already been well thought through and well executed, can actually that be easily transferred to another Accord so that you can actually easily transfer that within your community. So certainly that this is the beginning of the conversation. I don't know if Iona, you wanted to mention anything about that sharing of of, of stories and, and some of the case studies. So if you have a great case study, please let Iona know because we, we're really keen to actually see how we can collaborate and share some of these ideas. And we actually, and you'll, you'll see that with the secondary supply one um, that was mentioned earlier and there's some been some visuals up on the screen. Um, whenever you are doing a, a good, um, you know, whether it's an education campaign or any type of um, strategy, we actually do work to um, put that into a package and uh, allow if others across the state and it actually builds momentum and it does add strength to the campaign. So where we had the secondary supply one in the Northern Beaches, um, that the particularly the CDATs who were, um, you know, really the key driver behind that, um, so the Community Drug Action Team, um, the key driver behind that. Um, we saw then, I think it was eastern suburbs, pick that up and apply it to the bottle bags. So you can even pick different elements. So it doesn't have to be the full-blown campaign. They did a lot of work on that. They got a lot of in-kind contribution. They had graphic designers and people putting in professional man hours for free because they saw the, the importance of the campaign. Um, but you can just take one element of that that you think is relevant to your area and then apply that. So do let us know. Yeah. Um. I just, sorry, John, I took right. the microphone out of your hand. Uh, just to, about those, you know, the social media campaigns and the social marketing campaigns and those, um, it's, it's important, like I mentioned, on their own, they're not very useful. But mm -hmm. if they're attached to something weighty like legislation, and that's, you know, click, like front and back, uh, drink and drive, you're a bloody idiot. The, the thing that actually changed behaviour was the legislation. Yeah, and, and don't be a tosser, 200 bucks fine. Yeah. 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 yeah, so yeah. so they're important to do, but they, they we just need to make sure they're attached to something weighty and it's not just trying to convince people because everyone's trying to convince people of everything. <laughs> yeah. 
And, and just on the stop supply campaign and the hungover you're over, that they were um, accompanied with enforcement campaigns. So the local police were very much involved in both of those. Um, and just on your suggestion about the liquor accords getting together um, to, to maybe do something um, around p telling people to leave, it's, it's also about being able to maybe pull some resources so you get a really big and professional campaign. It's not just about sharing ideas and sharing separate case studies. So potentially if liquor accords can all work together, you can put tens of thousands of dollars to, towards something rather than 2,000 here, 2,000 there. So you might, get a, you might be able to get something on television or... So the next thing we would just like to give you a little bit of an update is we actually said that we have a lot of collaborators that we work with um, from the department's point of view. And one, I'd like to welcome Nikki Woolley and she's going to actually talk just very briefly about what CDAT are doing and also a really fantastic initiative called Good Sports. So Nikki, could you give everyone just a little brief overview about those two? Uh, yeah, hi, so I'm from Australian Drug Foundation. We've got a, a couple of programs, one of which has been talked quite a lot about, which is uh, community drug action teams. And I think you've had a really good understanding of what can happen where one CDAT has a great idea, they work with partners who are on the CDAT, including the Liquor Accord, including health promotion, and they build something over a number of years. And so what, we've got 70 CDATs right around the state, and for all of you who aren't in the Northern Beaches, what, do you, what can you do with that? Well, we can help you take it to your own Liquor Accord, and um, the example of Stop the Supply, which by the way, I've brought lots of copies of the posters and put them outside, and also the Plan B posters, so if you want to grab those, um, please feel free. So what we can do is help you link with your local community drug action team, which is a bunch of people who work or are living in the community and who are worried about drugs and alcohol and their issues align with the liquor accords. So if you're not sure how to get hold of a CDAT, this is, um, if you go to the Australian Drug Foundation, adf.org.au, and then it's a forward slash CDAT, we can help link you with your CDAT. Now what we suggest you do is you, you, you join the CDAT, uh, you invite a CDAT person to join your liquor accord and you have some conversations about what you can do together. And what you've got is the benefit of the link directly with the concerned community and it meets what you want to do and it meets what they want to do. So as well as the stop the supply example, there's another one in Byron Bay which I think is really good where um, there was a whole range of different things related to schoolies. Now I know a lot of that happens out of the city but a lot happens in the city too. There's a particular defined time where there's quite a lot of risk and you might want to work with a CDAT, a lot of them work on schoolies issues, on getting some information out there, having a smaller campaign, perhaps something, having something in the bottle shop, something in the venues, perhaps a bit of a game, um, being, being involved in the wider community, not just in your own licensed venue. And there's been some amazing successes up in Byron Bay around that. Mm -hmm. um, how many people have heard of community drug action teams before today? Yeah, so there's quite a range of them in the city, right out west and up into the north and down into the south. So um, very happy for you to contact me or, and you can contact me through Olga uh, and we'll hook you up with them. And secondly, I want to talk about good sports. Uh, how many of you are involved in community sport in some way, either as a player or as a parent or as an ex-player or as a go to a club? Yeah, great. Okay, so we've got a program called Good Sports, which... Um, has actually been mentioned in the Liquor Act review as something that's to be recommended to um, the community to get involved with. And what it is, is just a way of using, you know how s alcohol is a big part of Australian culture, s sport is a bigger one, often they're aligned. So what the Australian Drug Foundation's done is we've built a program where we encourage um, community sports clubs to get involved uh, with meeting their requirements under the alcohol legislation and also smoke free and we work with the committee to help them get what needs to be done either whether they're licensed or unlicensed. Now the benefit for you, um, how many of you with your licenses or your accords perhaps uh, actually sponsor community sports clubs? Not that many, that's surprising. Can you just put your hands up again? Okay, yeah, so um, what we've found really good with uh, Good Sports is when a licensed venue says, yep, we'll sponsor your league, and however, uh, we don't want to be associated with any risky behaviour that might happen at your club or at the end of the season event at our venue, so therefore we want all the clubs who are working with us to be Good Sports accredited. And then the reason why we want you to do that is that we've been able to show that Good sports clubs, um, anyone who's involved, their risk 
of risky drinking declines by 37% uh, right across the whole week, not just when they're at the club. So it's a well-proven program that uh, you can link in with and we think it can have benefits for you as well because then you get to say all our clubs are good sports clubs, we support the community, uh, sport is part of our community, we're part of the community and we're all working together which is a, uh, a, good, a good story to be told and it uh, be really great to work up some, some case studies around that. So I've also got outside just a simple flyer about good sports. It's very easy to get involved with it and we can hook you up with one of our project officers or our managers to find out more. And it's something concrete your liquor record can do. It's already set up. It's a simple matter of connecting in with it. doesn't require you to start it from scratch. It doesn't require you to have a set up campaign in your area, but it's something concrete you can do right now. So I suggest you get involved. Is there any questions about either of those programs? Since um, well before 2000, so probably 17 years, we're, we're in 8,000 clubs around Australia now and 2,000 in New South Wales, so it's pretty sizeable. And it's a fantastic initiative and it's one where you start looking at responsible, individual responsibility. It's a brilliant program and it's really starting to really get momentum um, nationally. It's a really great program. So just um, one thing I'd just like to introduce Serena Wise, if you just want to pop up. Serena's um, one of the compliance teams from OLGR and she actually goes into venues and helps venues. So if you've got any questions at all, very specifically, very individual questions that you'd like to ask Serena, she's a wealth of knowledge but she's also a wealth of practical advice. So things that um, certainly throughout all the regions that we've been going to, we've been giving a lot of venues um, support around things like plans of management. The amount of people that are still operating a plans of management off a templated plan of management really is still quite, quite re revealing, one should say. And really, if you aren't actually looking at your own plan of management, how you're operating your own practices um, in this day and age, it's a really important one. So Serena's got some really fabulous advice on that. Also, compliance self-health health checks. One of the big bits of feedback we've had as we've popped around and done these regional um, information exchanges, how, you know, 10 p.m., a joint operation will come in with council, police, and also um, OLGR, and they'll be coming in and they'll pinging us for a sign. And basically, the advice from every regulator has been a sign is housekeeping. A sign is something that you, in your own teams, should be managing 10 p.m. at night. It's not that they want to get you for a sign, it's just they're there. And if they notice it, there's many, many licensees, as you heard this morning in Rosemary's presentation. If they're in your venue doing a check, they will do a comprehensive check. And so it's really important that you understand your obligations, you understand what's, what's expected of you, and more importantly, that you understand how to do your own self-checks. And actually, it's a fantastic training tool. Very, really, really great training tool for any of you new staff coming through to get them to go and do a compliance health check. So that's something that Serena can also help you with. Um, signage as well. Um, did you want to mention anything about some of the things that are online, Serena, in terms of how people can do their own self-checks and signage self-checks? Um, I think most of the guys here know about the tools and um, fact sheets we have on our website, but obviously there's the self-audit checklist that we do really recommend. We're actually reviewing those currently. Um, obviously there's been a lot of amendments with legislation, there have been some changes to those um, checklists, so we are going through that process now. Um, so the new one should be on the website very soon. But one thing I like to say about doing those self-audit checks and so on in your venue is keep a record of it. Um, if my guys come in and they, you know, the signs off the gaming machine, for example, if you can show us that you've done a check, you know, within the last few days at a really busy venue and you've got that documentation of, you know, the time and who did it and so on and you've got a running sort of commentary of, of those self-checks, we're obviously going to put that into consideration. That's going to go towards more likely getting a warning rather than getting that, that you know, $550 ticket for a sign. So um, it's definitely a good initiative. You, you do, um, have in your venues so you can um, you know, at least show us that you're trying your best and using those initiatives where you can. So I think that's the general yep. take on that sort and of so thing. And so Serena's really great too to, if you need to have any clarification or double check in around secondary supply, also sale of liquor to um, alcohol to minors, obviously these are all some changes that have occurred in the legislation. So if you do need to have any double checks on that, certainly over lunch you can do that. Serena will be there for lunch. So just in closing off, what we'd love to do is we did say um, that that this was an information exchange and a part of this project is that we're very keen to continually get feedback, certainly industry feedback, anyone um, that would like to provide some, um, really any piece of information to us. One of the key things that we've got on this bit of paper, we'd really love you to fill out before we head off to lunch. In fact, we might lock the door unless you 
give it one. Um, but we'd love to hear about successes. And one of the things that you've even heard again today is people are he he really, really keen to hear what's going on right throughout, what you're doing, what is successful. So if you could tell us, it'll be really helpful in terms of us building our case study bank so that we can actually refer others on to other. And also um, the challenges. So one of the things that we're also really keen on, what do you see the, some of the challenges to be as we, as we head towards the future? What would you like to continue to see um, OLGR help and assist with? As you've already heard today, there is a review of some of the education programs, some of the industry programs. So if there's anything that you're incredibly keen to hear, some information on, we'd love you to tell us what you see some of the challenges are so we can start to respond to those. So I'll just give you a minute or so to fill that out if you don't mind. Just while you're finishing that off, I just thought I'd quickly touch on, you had a question earlier Wayne, um, about getting different license types to the accords and this is something we hear a lot of and I was just going to see if anyone actually has any good ideas on how they do this because I know David Cass from Surrey Hills has a fairly high membership rate um, for people coming along to his meetings and joining up and you actually take a unique um, approach if you don't mind talking on it and I've never seen you to be shy before um, <laughs> about um, <laughs> sending out um, invoices with you and doing quite a successful membership drive do you do you want to share that with others that might help them get others along to their meetings we uh, realized with over 365 venues in our local area that the cost of administration not that there's a huge amount of administration but actually you know, corresponding and, and sending out information, and whilst email is cheap, there's other things that people want in hard copy, uh, was somewhat costly. Um, and so we uh, have, for another reason, put on a membership fee. We found, after talking to many of those 360-odd venues, that people, f whilst they were supportive of the concept of an accord, um, didn't have any real feeling of affinity to the Accord unless they felt that they were joining on an annual basis. So we charged a hundred bucks for those premises that trade uh, before midnight and for those that trade after midnight, uh, $400 per annum. It's helped um, administration it's but more importantly it's helped people feel that they have a sense of belonging because they've paid some money and what do they get out of it um, we've got to the stage now probably because of the lockouts and the cessation at three o'clock of alcohol service um, of not having too many incidents in fact the lowest level of recorded incidents in history in our area so we've found that there's less need to hold regular meetings or meetings on a very regular basis we're down to about two meetings a year but we've complemented that by sending out a newsletter at least every two months with relevant local information and we've found that people are extremely happy that they don't have to come to another boring meeting um, <laughs> and, and uh, listen to regulators, um, and that they prefer to get their information on a one-page email. Um, so a combination of those things has is, is, is helped. Is that what you wanted me to say? Oh, yes, and, and we, we invoice people uh, each year in January, um, give them as long as they want to pay, but generally people have been p paid within the, f the first month. And we've got enough money then to, to fund a few things and, and, and I must say to fund a, a little bit of an allowance uh, uh, for the uh, court coordinator because, you know, there is some work to be done and, uh, and work doesn't come cheap. Well, not very cheap. <laughs> so uh, all those things uh, uh, have helped. But more, I really think the, the emphasis is that the, the fee uh, allowed people to, to sense that they, they really belonged. Thank you so very much for sharing that with us. I so would also say that I think from an accord... Yeah, try and stop me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'd also say from an accord point of view, and to all of you representing accords, when we get to the stage of governments looking at the review of the Liquor Act, and I know it's only part of it, but I think we should all be promoting more compulsory membership of accords. Now, some people may not agree, 
but the voluntary nature ain't good enough. We're not, we're not getting enough interest, particularly from restaurants and licensed cafes and so on. And if we, as Accords, individually can promote that idea that uh, the government looks at more compulsory requirements, I know some venues have got it as part of their development, uh, development consent conditions and so on, but they look at more compulsory membership, I think we'll have a far more useful and effective Accords structure. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. Just to add to that, Gosh, can I give them a microphone? They don't get it. <laughs> can I get uh, a show of hands? Who charges membership fees or pays membership fees as part of their accord? Is there anyone here who doesn't? So, um, oh, so there's one person that doesn't. Okay, there's there's that campaign, um, the hungover you're over campaign, and I believe the secondary supply as well. Um, the funding that was just from membership fees, the the, the funding from the accord that went in yep. to actually help that. Um, campaign get off the ground. So, uh, yeah, we're talking as simple as, you know, perhaps around $100 per member per year and you can do an, a campaign like that. So, just um, following on from th what this gentleman was saying, um, Rob systematically invoices every person that has a liquor licence um, and people just basically see a really cheap invoice and go, oh, I guess i got to pay it. <laughs> so, that, uh, as far as they're concerned, they think it's mandatory. Um, they just go, uh, this is the li liquor licence fees for this year. And <laughs> Yeah, and so final comment. There's no one Rob, here from quickly. the liquor court. Just, yeah, just on that, that whole notion of compulsory membership and versus voluntary, etc. We, we, I'm finding in our accord that with the introduction of uh, putting people on the on the DA, you have to be a member. It sometimes makes people disgruntled to come along. Yeah. So yeah. that that's one challenge that we have. The the comment that I'll make in relation to the fees, I think with the risk based license fee scheme having come about over the past few months. I think the best thing that the government could probably do for us Accord people is use some of that money to at least target one of these campaigns on a, on a larger scale. And that way, when we go to our Accord meetings and people are having to pay this extra money to, to be a licensee and to, to run a licensed premises, at least they can see that their money is going to something proactive that is going to benefit all of us. That would be something that I definitely uh, think that should, should be put forward as, as, a, as a suggestion. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Rob. So look, in, in closing today, there's a lot of different collateral that's been um, shown to you today. Most of it is either on the tables in here or, or the tables outside. Um, please feel free to take that. If you do need any additional resources, particularly from an Accord point of view, please feel free to take additional bags or additional things. And certainly all of the different, um, basically, pr people we've had here today are very happy to supply direct to Accord. Certainly, Health, I know, are happy to, to provide on more um, more of the no the smoking signs and et cetera, et cetera. So if you do need any of those, please let us know. Um, and also in this bag, there's a number of different um, things that is provided to you. But the one little thing to point out to you, there's actually a little card in there that's actually a USB card. So don't kind of just think, oh yeah, that's a random bit of thing in there. It's actually a USB card and it's actually got most of the materials that you can get online actually there. So you don't even need to download from the website, you can download it directly to there. So it's a useful little tool that's got everything on there. So we highlight that to you. Um, as I said, feel free to take more, any of those the people that are representing their accords, please feel free to take those with you. We'd really love it if you can join us for lunch. Um, most of the staff that have been here today will be available to talk to you some more. So please approach people if you've got any individual questions. And we really do thank you for coming along today and giving up your time. Um, we appreciate you gaining better information. So thanks so much. Thank you.